This lecture will look at the roads not taken when it comes to voting rights, uh, looking at the early precedent that relied on the text and history of the Constitution in order uh, to justify judicial abstention when it came to questions of voting rights. Uh, and so we'll look at uh, the sort of cases that um, take a very textualist approach, sort of limit themselves to the text of the Constitution, such as with Minor versus Happersett, a case that said women don't have the right to vote under the 14th Amendment, as well as Richardson versus Ramirez, which was a case that uh, still good to this day, which says that uh, states are allowed to disenfranchise people on the basis of a felony conviction. Then we'll look at uh, a series of cases which emphasize sort of pragmatism, why the courts shouldn't be uh, involved in protecting voting rights. Look at the case of Giles versus Harris, for example, which uh, upheld sort of openly disenfranchising provisions of the Alabama Constitution, um, as well as uh, mention, we'll mention Colgrove versus Green, uh, which is the case that preceded the one person, one vote cases, uh, but warned of a dissent in the political thicket uh, if the court were to start striking down redistricting plans. And then finally, uh, there's there are a series of cases that just uh, make the argument that, you know, sometimes there are good state interests uh, when it comes to disenfranchising people or making it difficult for them to vote. So when the court upheld literacy tests in a case called Lassiter versus Northampton County, it sort of made the arguments as to why um, the court, uh, why a state might have good reasons for requiring that voters be able to pass a literacy test. So starting with Minor versus Happersett as, as sort of a lens through which we can view the, um, the textualist approach to uh, voting rights in the 14th Amendment. Um, this was a case brought by, brought by Virginia Minor, who actually had to have her husband sign the uh, litigation papers because women were not allowed to do so. Uh, and she was saying after the passage of the 14th Amendment that the 14th Amendment granted women the right to vote. Um, although the Equal Protection Clause was certainly mentioned uh, in her complaint, um, she was specifically uh, litigating under the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment and saying uh, that that granted women the right to vote. The court rejected that argument, uh, but it, it's sort of interesting to walk through the rationales of the court to understand why at the time of the 14th Amendment, it didn't think that it guaranteed women the right to vote. Because as was discussed in earlier lectures, eventually the Supreme Court is going to read the 14th Amendment as preventing discrimination with respect uh, to the right to vote. And so these arguments that Virginia Minor made uh, in the 1870s are ones that won the day uh, roughly 90 years later. And so why did the court say that women are not guaranteed the right to vote under the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And what the court says is that the 14th Amendment didn't grant any new rights. It didn't add to the privileges and immunities of a citizen. It simply furnished an additional guarantee for the protection of such as he already had. And so the court applies a kind of original meaning or textualist approach here that there's nothing in the 14th Amendment that says, oh, here are the new privileges and immunities. It simply says, that no state can deprive anyone uh, of the privileges and immunities of citizenship. And so then the question is, well, is voting a privilege and immunity of citizenship? And so what the court does, as do courts uh, well after 1875 when this decision came down, the court says that suffrage was never coextensive with citizenship, right? We have voting rights and we have citizens and those two categories don't necessarily uh, overlap all of the time. And so there are many citizens at the time of the founding and even today who are not able to vote, obviously children, uh, later on, you know, people with uh, felony convictions, uh, uh, there were property qualifications at the time of uh, the, uh, the formation of the constitution. And so you can't say that the original sort of privileges and immunities of citizenship as guaranteed in the constitution included voting rights given how many citizens uh, didn't have the right to vote. And then there are examples of where non-citizens were given the right to vote at the time of the founding. Um, and it was left up to the state legislatures or localities as to whether uh, certain non-citizens uh, could vote. And so given that citizenship and voting rights were not coterminous, you couldn't say that, um, that voting was a privilege and immunity of US citizenship. And so just starting out with that um, is, is sort of one of the problems uh, that Virginia Minor confronted, which is that as an originalist matter, as a textualist matter, um, that there was no sort of history 
of reading the Privileges and Immunities Clause, either in the text of the Constitution or in the 14th Amendment, as protecting voting rights. But uh, there, she, she's got a, another textualist argument against her, and that has to do with a section of the 14th Amendment that's not as famous as the sort of glorified phrases in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. And Section 2 of the 14th Amendment is the first place in the Constitution uh, that uses the word male. Uh, and because of that, the court says that uh, it specifically contemplates the possibility that women will be disenfranchised. So let's just walk through what Section 2 of the 14th Amendment says uh, and how it is used in this case to imply that women don't have the right to vote under either the Equal Protection Clause or the Privileges and Immunities Clause. So after the Civil War, when the 14th Amendment is passed and we have these um, you know, important provisions on due process, equal protection, privileges, and immunities, um, there's also a provision that is uh, trying to ensure that the um, states do not disenfranchise African-Americans who have new been newly liberated as slaves uh, or from slavery. And so uh, Section 2 of the 14th Amendment is actually a kind of political provision that guarantees that if a state starts disenfranchising uh, African-Americans or disenfranchising uh, groups of people, that its representation in the House of Representatives will be reduced. So the idea here is if you sort of disenfranchised half of the, um, the otherwise eligible voter population, that then maybe you'd have half the number of representatives that you'd be otherwise entitled to in the U.S. House of Representatives. It was a way of punishing states that continued to engage in disenfranchisement, and thereby you could protect um, African Americans who, under the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, uh, post-slavery, where um, the Constitution was guaranteeing that their rights would be restored. Um, and so Section 2 of the 14th Amendment has particular words in it to guarantee this, um, th this protection and to make sure that states would be punished if they disenfranchised people. But notice uh, the words that it uses and how it uh, limits this sort of this corrective, this remedy uh, when it comes to reducing the number of representatives in the House of Representatives. So um, what it says is that representatives of Congress um, will be apportioned among the, sta the states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole persons, a number of persons in each state, excluding Indians, not taxed. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for president, vice president of the United States, representatives of Congress, the executive and judicial officers of the state, when any of those officers, the right to vote for those officers, is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state, being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced. And so the idea here is that if Section 2 of the 14th Amendment only deprive states of additional representation based on disenfranchisement of men, then you can't read section one of the 14th Amendment as having guaranteed women the right to vote. And so this textualist argument, right, is, is a quite powerful argument for why uh, the original framers of the 14th Amendment uh, didn't think that it was an enfranchising uh, women. And indeed, you need not just stake with the, with the 14th Amendment, you could look at the 15th Amendment as well, because if the 14th Amendment provided not just voting rights for women, but, but acknowledged that voting was a privilege and immunity of citizenship, then we wouldn't have needed the 15th Amendment, which prevents against discrimination with respect to the right to vote on grounds of race. And so the, the, that we sometimes call that an intertextualist argument or a structure and relationship kind of argument, um, that you look at another part of the Constitution, another amendment, in order to interpret uh, the substance of uh, one of the of, of the, the the constitutional amendment or the provision that is at issue. And so the argument here again is that the Fourteenth Amendment can't possibly be read as giving the right to vote because otherwise you wouldn't have needed the Fifteenth or then possibly the Nineteenth Amendment later uh, to guarantee uh, uh, racial minorities and then women uh, the right to vote. Now, you might think that this argument, this kind of very strict textualist argument, sort of is a relic of the past, that it's only sort of in these uh, sort of pre-1900 kinds of cases um, dealing with something like disenfranchisement of women, where this, this kind of textualist argument would be relevant, because later on, as we've uh, sort of been hinting, the Supreme Court's going to read the Equal Protection Clause as uh, guaranteeing the right to vote. 
Um, but no, the, the, this textualist argument continues to this day, and it is it remains the basis for why states are allowed to disenfranchise felons. Uh, and so in the case of Richardson versus Ramirez in 1974, the Supreme Court engages in a very similar uh, textualist argument, reading Section 2 of the 14th Amendment as uh, basically providing textual support for the idea that a state is allowed to deprive people of the right to vote based on previous felony convictions. And so uh, we've read that, that provision of Section 2 that, that applies and uses the word male, but notice that there, there's a, a phrase that follows it that says um, that the apportionment of represent, representatives among the, the states um, will be denied based on how much of the male population is being disenfranchised, except if that disenfranchisement is happening for participation in rebellion or other crime, right? And so the idea here is that um, th that the the uh, representation in the U.S. House of Representatives will not be reduced if the people that you are disenfranchising are those who uh, participated in a rebellion or committed a crime. Now, we know why this provision was included in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. Uh, obviously, you know, what rebellion are they talking about if not the Civil War? And the 14th Amendment uh, follows the Civil War, as does the 13th and, and 15th Amendment. And so when they talk about rebellion or other crime, part of the question in Richardson versus Ramirez, is, is it about the kind of crimes that are related to rebellion, or is it pretty much any crime that you can, uh, or at least any felony, that can be caused for disenfranchisement? And the court says, Crime means crime, right? You don't have to tie it to uh, crimes related to the rebellion, related to the Civil War. Um, that uh, that the Section Two of the, of the Fourteenth Amendment contemplates that um, that felon disenfranchisement will not lead to a reduction in the amount of representatives that a particular state would have in the U.S. House of Representatives. And so the court, even in 1974, and this is good law to this day, acknowledges that. Um, section 2 of the 14th Amendment sort of amends Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. So no, even though the court may have held that the Equal Protection Clause guarantees the right to vote, um, that there's sort of a categorical exception uh, when, it comes to, um, when it comes to people who have committed crimes. I want to be clear, though, that this doesn't mean that a state can just disenfranchise felons whenever it wants uh, and forever for any reason. Um, Felon disfranchisement laws are just like other laws, that if they are passed with discriminatory purpose and discriminatory effect, they would violate the Equal Protection Clause's suspect classification prong as well. And so there are cases like Hunter versus Underwood, and even some contemporary cases that are going through the courts, where the argument is that while felon disenfranchisement on its face might be constitutional in, in many circumstances, um, that if the selection of the crimes for which people are disenfranchised or evidence at the time of the passage of the these laws suggests that they were a thinly veiled attempt to try to disenfranchise people on the basis of race, well, then it can still be struck down uh, under the Equal Protection Clause. And so while Richardson versus Ramirez says that there's nothing per se uh, unconstitutional about felon disfranchisement laws, Hunter versus Underwood and its progeny tells us that if you sort of are disenfranchising felons in order to effectuate a system of racial discrimination, then that uh, could be unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause. So Minor versus Happersett and um, Richardson versus Ramirez are good examples of the kind of textualist limits on judicial intervention when it comes to uh, protecting voting rights. But for much of the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, the court would uh, articulate other kinds of rationale for why it should not be involved in uh, protecting voting rights. And Giles versus Harris is in some ways the most extreme articulation of that impulse, uh, because in that case, the court upholds the Alabama constitutional provisions that employ grandfather clauses and literacy uh, tests that disenfranchised uh, most African Americans uh, in, the, the, in that state. And this was characteristic of uh, laws throughout the South. Um, passed after the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, these laws effectu effectively were trying to just uh, you know, keep African Americans as second-class citizens, deprive them completely of their voting rights, and they had the effect of doing so, uh, so that up until the 1960s, um, uh, in the, from the period of the sort of retrenchment after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments up through the 60s, uh, there was very little 
participation by African Americans in most parts of the South when it comes to voting. And so what did the court say in Giles versus Harris to justify what was a kind of bald-faced uh, violation of the 15th Amendment and the attempt of these post-Civil War amendments to enfranchise African Americans? Uh, what Oliver Wendell Holmes says in that opinion is that equity cannot undertake now more than it has in the past to enforce political rights. That's a kind of complicated, uh, typical Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, flowery sentence. What does it mean? Well, it means that you know, when it comes to voting rights, that when you are, uh, the court at the time was, was contemplating the idea of judicial intervention, that they, they sort of read these complaints as requiring the court to come in and sort of strike down the entire constitution of Alabama, that the entire uh, political system was unconstitutional because it was sort of root and branch a violation of the right to vote, or at least the protection against discrimination with respect to the right to vote uh, in the 15th Amendment. And so by saying that equity can't uh, you know, undertake now more than it has in the past to enforce political rights, uh, the court was saying that this is not our area, that we are not going to get involved because there are just uh, too many obstacles uh, to judicial intervention uh, or successful judicial intervention to sort of hold the, the state accountable, the local registrars of voters accountable to force them to start um, uh, putting these voters on the roll. It's not dissimilar from what we saw even uh, 40 years later in the Supreme Court's uh, case of Cold Grove versus Green, though that was that that sort of articulated some other concerns about judicial intervention. Um, and so while while Giles versus Harris is saying that look that this is sort of beyond judicial competence, this is beyond uh, our mandate as judges to essentially declare an entire state's political system as unconstitutional. On Cold Grove versus Green, Justice Frankfurter says that look. We shouldn't get involved in striking down malapportioned legislatures or congressional districts, that is, districts where you have radically different numbers of people in them. Um, because, uh, as the court says there, it's hostile to a democratic system to involve the judiciary and the politics of the people in an essentially political contest dressed up in the abstract phrases of the law and warns of sort of dissent in the political thicket. Uh, but the idea here is that it's not only is it um, difficult, uh, maybe even impossible, as Giles versus Harris maintained, for the court to go in and fundamentally uh, challenge and strike down uh, the political system or the electoral system of a state. But sometimes um, there are good prudential reasons why it shouldn't. Uh, and getting involved in partisan politics, which inevitably is what happens when uh, judges get involved in striking down voting laws or, or reconfiguring electoral systems, that that puts the judges in uh, sort of an inherent fight with uh, the elected officials. And so um, that, that you know, could lead to accusations that the judges are behaving in a partisan way. Um, it could lead to interbranch controversy where the Congress or the state legislatures then uh, retaliate against the judges. Um, and so uh, for prudential reasons, uh, to sort of to keep uh, the judges in their zone, uh, the court for many years was saying that, look, it should stay out of uh, politics. Now, in some ways, the, the, these, these earlier cases seem um, not only relics, but uh, sort of charming examples of, an, of uh, judicial restraint um, from a time before judges uh, exercised their, their muscle under the Constitution to strike down any number of laws, whether under the First Amendment, under criminal uh, rights protections, the 14th Amendment, or other provisions. Um, but if you look at, uh, you know, the, the, the court case Bush versus Gore in, in 2000, the court sort of puts to bed uh, this notion and um, makes clear that in the modern era that um, the court is going to be much more aggressive. So uh, the court says there that none are more conscious of the vital limits on the judicial authority than are members of this court. And none stand more in admiration of the Constitution's design to leave the selection of the president to the people through their legislatures into the political sphere. But it says when contending parties invoke the process of the courts, however, it becomes our unsought responsibility to resolve the federal and constitutional issues the judicial system has been forced to confront. Very different approach than you know, saying that this is too political or that the court doesn't have the power uh, to enforce the 15th Amendment in Alabama. Um, as, as of the time of Bush versus Gore, as well as much earlier, uh, the court was uh, had sort of decided uh, in the 1960s through the, the creation of the right to vote or invocation of the right to vote in the 14th Amendment and later cases uh, to fully tackle a lot of these inequities in the political process.
In addition to textualist and pragmatic arguments for judicial abstention when it comes to uh, questions of voting rights and elections, uh, there's also cases, there are also cases where um, the court is simply deferential to state interest in regulating the franchise and sometimes uh, disenfranchising large swaths of the population. So take the situation of literacy tests, for example. In the case of Lassiter versus Northampton County in 1959, the court upheld the literacy test in North Carolina that required voters to be able to read and write any section of the Constitution of North Carolina in the English language. Now, the court there didn't uh, say that the right to vote was fundamental. It didn't say that um, strict scrutiny would apply as later it would. Uh, and instead applied something like rationality review, saying that the ability to read and write has some relation to standards designed to promote intelligent use of the ballot. Especially, it says, in our society where newspapers, periodicals, books, and other printed matter canvas and debate campaign issues, a state might conclude that only those who are literate should exercise the franchise. Now, the court went to, sort of to pains to emphasize that if a literacy test was motivated by racial discrimination, as most of them were right at the time in, in many places, disenfranchising African-Americans, but also poor whites. But um, um, if you look at some of the early debates in North Carolina and elsewhere, it was quite clear that there was uh, racial discrimination involved here. But that's not what this challenge is about. It's not about a literacy test designed or intentionally uh, proven to um, uh, deprive African-Americans of the right to vote. Just on its face, though, the court says that there's no problem in requiring literacy uh, as a precondition uh, for voting. Now, Justin, th this case has never actually been overturned um, um, specifically, but um, Congress later amended the Voting Rights Act to prevent literacy tests. So uh, we've never had an opportunity um, to fully take on um, the, the rationale in Lassiter versus Northampton County. And you might wonder whether even on its own terms it would survive today in an era of uh, television, radio, uh, the internet. Uh, do these rationales about um, the written word and how important, say, uh, something like newspapers were in justifying uh, a literacy test as a basis for sort of limiting the franchise to those who would, might be keeping up with the news um, um, with respect to politics. But uh, it shows you sort of the, the, the way that the court in the sort of before 1960 was thinking about the right to vote and how there were many state interests like limiting the franchise to those who were primarily interested in politics and primarily uh, capable of understanding political issues, that that was a legitimate, uh, maybe even compelling interest uh, for uh, regulating voting rights.